Rob Schmidt of the Capital Account Financial Regulation Newsletter. And on behalf of myself and the Center for Audit Quality, I'd like to welcome everybody to SOX, the evolution of corporate reporting, or as we like to say it around here, happy birthday, Sarbanes-Oxley. Um, SEC Chair Gensler is about to give a speech. And of course, he really needs no introduction, but uh, I'll give you a brief background before being confirmed to head the SEC. Uh, he was chair of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission um, and pertinent to today's discussion, he was a, a top aide to Senator Paul Sarbanes during the drafting of Sarbanes-Oxley. And before that, Chair, I hope I get this right, but at the time, he was the youngest person ever to be made partner at Goldman Sachs. So welcome, Chair Gensler. Thank you for your time and uh, the stage is yours. Well, thank you so much, Rob. You're, you're ever so kind. Uh, for that introduction. It's good to be with the Center for Audit Quality. As is customary, I'd like to note that I am speaking on behalf of myself and not on behalf of the commission or SEC staff. Now, as I open my remarks today, I'd like to discuss a speech from a different summertime conference, one that took place 133 years ago. Now, we're going back to June 1889, and the statistician, Carol D. Wright, spoke at the Convention of Commissioners of Bureaus of Statistics of Labor, and he was speaking in Hartford, Connecticut. Now, to be clear, I wasn't there, but Mr. Wright, the first U.S. Commissioner of Labor, used his opening remarks to warn against the abuse of numbers for personal gain. And I quote, figures will not lie, he said, but quote, liars will figure. Now, I think of this maxim often, and now it's not only because Carol Wright said it, but my grandfather, Ellis Tillis, an immigrant from Lithuania, was said to have often say the same thing. But his went a little different. Liars don't figure, but figures sure can lie. And um, I'm sorry, figures don't lie, but liars sure can figure. I'm sorry, I have to remember my grandfather's saying. But 40 years after that statistics conference, in 1929, the stock market crashed. Our country learned all too well what happens when liars figure eroding trust. Finance ultimately is about trust. In the depths of the Great Depression, Congress and President Franklin Delano Roosevelt tried to restore that trust through the first federal securities law. In fact, Franklin Delano Roosevelt even called it the Truth and Securities Act. They started with requirements for public companies raising money from the public. Specifically, these companies had to provide full, fair, and truthful disclosure to the public. Investors needed facts and figures that, could, that they could trust, figures without the liars. Now, nearly 70 years after those first securities laws were established, our system, frankly, was breaking down. The energy conglomerate, Enron, was then the seventh largest company in the United States. And then in December of 2001, it collapsed, the largest bankruptcy in US history. Enron's management had cooked the books, concealed problems in the business, defrauded investors and more. Its failures wiped out more than $2 billion in pension plan assets, tens of thousands of jobs, and yes, including at Enron's audit firm, Arthur Anderson. Six months later, the Securities and Exchange Commission filed allegations against WorldCom, once the largest handler of internet data, whose failure and bankruptcy surpassed even Enron's, which had been the largest to date. Those scandals were followed by other multi-billion dollar accounting frauds at Adelphia and Tyco. In response to the crisis 20 years ago this week, happy birthday, President George W. Bush signed the Sarbanes-Oxley Act into law. I was honored to be there as he signed it at the West House, at the White House. It had passed almost unanimously in the House and 99 to zero in the Senate. The late Paul Sarbanes, my hometown senator from Maryland, was the new chair of the Senate Banking Committee. I was honored to have a front row seat to all of this, working as his senior advisor on the legislation. A central goal of Sarbanes-Oxley was, once again, to restore trust in our financial system. In two decades since, what have we learned? 
what has worked, what is still a work in progress. So first, the Enron crisis revealed a key problem, the quality of auditing standards. Candidly, the relationship between issuers on one hand, the companies, and auditors on the other hand, between the standard setters and the auditing firms was too clubby. It matters who sets the standards. It matters who audits the auditors. Auditing standards were set by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, AICPA, a professional organization, and the profession was writing its own rules. That's an inherent conflict. Additionally, auditing firms were tasked with inspecting each other. Naturally, such inspections had conflicts, failing to identify serious shortcomings in auditor independence and audit quality. So to correct course, Senator Sarbanes working with uh, Chair Oxley in the House, bipartisan, established the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board an independently funded board under the regulatory oversight of the SEC. And the PCOB was and is tasked with setting enhanced auditing standards. And for practical purposes, Congress permitted the then new PCAOB to carry over existing AICPA standards on an interim basis. I remember the debates. The expectation was that the board would produce a more appropriate set of standards going forward, but in the interim, carry over this professional association set of standards. Historically though, the PCOB has been too slow to update auditing standards. 20 years later, most of those interim standards remain on the books. In May of this year, in 2022, the PCAOB announced that it plans to update almost all of the remaining interim standards. I look forward to these critical auditing standard updates. And while they have their work cut out for them, I believe Chair Erica Williams and the board can live up to Congress's original vision with respect to standard setting. I'm hopeful we can make some progress before Sarbanes-Oxley turns 21 and can so to speak, legally drink. In addition, the PCOB is tasked with inspecting and investigating auditing firms for compliance with the standards. So write the standards, but then inspect and investigate against those standards. And when necessary, bring enforcement actions. Inspections, investigations, and enforcement are critical components of instilling trust in our capital markets, in the figures. Under the current leadership, the PCOB has a chance to reinvigorate its enforcement program to work to improve auditing standards coupled with rigorous enforcement of auditors' professional and ethical requirements. That's kind of essential for investor protection. And the Sarbanes-Oxley gave the SEC also a fair fund authority to return monies directly to harm investors. And over the past eight years alone, the SEC has returned more than $5 billion to harmed investors. Accounting and auditing cases also are an important focus of the SEC's enforcement program. We have, we've had a number of these cases. I'm just gonna highlight one. We recently charged Ernst & Young with cheating by its auditors on certified public accounting ethics exams, no less, and withholding evidence of this misconduct in our investigation. This action underscores the importance for accounting firms of fulfilling their gatekeeper function in the spirit and yes, the letter of Sarbanes-Oxley. Another problem back to Enron was the crisis revealed was weak auditor independence. In many cases, including Enron, audit firms had lucrative consulting arrangements with the companies they were auditing. Thus, Sarbanes-Oxley directed the SEC to take steps to create a stronger barrier between the auditors and other parts of their firms where they had business dealing with their audit clients, with some exceptions. And a number of firms back then spun out their consulting business in the days shortly after the law was passed. But over the 20 years, 
we've seen that many of these firms went on to rebuild those consulting practices. The PCOB inspections continue to identify independence and lack of professional skepticism as a perennial problem area. Those advisory practices not only have grown, they've also gotten more complex. Given the growth in the size and complexity of non-audit services, it's important that audit firms maintain a culture of ethics and integrity, placing the highest priority on auditor independence throughout their firms, not just in the practice of their auditing. As my colleague, the chief accounting uh, accountant uh, at the SEC, Paul Munter recently noted, quote, staff have seen situations of decreased vigilance when it comes to auditor independence. So I've asked the PCOB, uh, Erica Williams and her team, to consider adding updates for auditor independence standards to their agenda. And we may need to take a fresh look at the SEC's own auditor independence rules as well. In the meantime, I do encourage the firms to review and enhance their independence protocols with respect to auditing and consulting practices. Back 20 years ago, there were certain issues also that Enron revealed about accounting standards. And in response, Sarbanes-Oxley Act provided that accounting standard setters, the Financial Accounting Standards Board, as you know it, would have secure independent funding. Previously, the FASB had to fundraise for itself, often from the issuers for which it was setting standards. And as a result, that created some conflicts. And also, the FASB was at times slow to adopt new standards and reluctant to tackle controversial topics. Sarbanes-Oxley sought to create more distance between the standard setters and industry. A third area was about corporate governance. And Sarbanes-Oxley established requirements regarding corporate governance and accountability to help ensure that the incentives of executives, boards, accounts, investors were better aligned. And you know some of these. For example, under Section 302 of the Act, the chief executive officer and chief financial officer have to sign off on the company's periodic financial statements. It strengthens accountability and control environment. And we routinely look to this and from time to time, it bring enforcement cases related to 302. In addition, another section, section 304 of the law, uh, spoke to certain executives having to reimburse uh, some of the compensation when an issuer is required to restate its financials. Later, as part of the Dodd-Frank Act, Congress also built upon these clawbacks around executive compensation. And we've recently reopened a comment file on a proposed rulemaking on that Dodd-Frank clawback provision. Now, Sarbanes-Oxley also required a lot of requirements around the corporate boards and their audit committees. The last thing I wanna mention is the coverage of foreign issuers in the United States. Congress required foreign issuers to comply with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act as well. And again, here the act led to a lot of progress along these 20 years. I recall watching negotiations between Senator Sarbanes and other members of Congress as they debated this key question. Should the legislation still in draft form and being considered by the full Senate, should it cover foreign issuers in the US? And I remember Senator Sarbanes thought about it. He was always thoughtful, but he was unambiguous he thought investors should be protected and should have the trust in the numbers, regardless of whether the issuer is foreign or domestic. He understood that it's a privilege to access US capital markets, the deepest, the largest, and most liquid in the world. And if a foreign issuer wanted access to the market, they needed to comply with our requirements. And he was always keenly focused on investor protection. This approach, of course, also benefits companies, giving a level playing field to the domestic companies that are competing with the foreign companies that you're accessing this market on a level field. Now, countries all over the world have strengthened the quality of auditor oversight. More than 50 jurisdictions have complied with the requirements of the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board's inspection 
uh, regimes and they inspect audit firms of US listing companies, but there's two jurisdictions that have not done so. You probably know this, it's China and Hong Kong. So Congress recently reaffirmed this commitment. This commitment that was in a law passed 99 to zero in the Senate was updated through something called the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act of 2020. And under this, this new provision, if the PCOB is, quote, unable to inspect or investigate completely, end quote, registered public accounting firms located in foreign jurisdictions, issuers that use those firms for three consecutive years, if they can't uh, inspect or investigate completely, then those firms face prohibitions on their securities trading in the US. Now, this bill, which unanimously passed the Senate, went to the president's desk in December of 2020, just I think two days before we lost uh, Senator Sarbanes. Going forward, will our markets include Chinese issuers? That's still up to our counterparts in China. It depends on whether they're willing to comply with the requirements of US law to be able to remain and have access to the world's deepest, most liquid markets. Consistent with the Holding Foreign Company Accountable Act, the SEC and the PCAOB have been negotiating with Chinese authorities on a statement of protocol to govern inspections and investigations of registered public companies, uh, of firms on the ground in China and Hong Kong. You see, we're not willing to have PCOB inspectors sent to China, sent to Hong Kong, unless there is an agreement on a framework allowing the PCAOB to inspect and investigate audit firms completely. Any framework would need to be very specific and be, have the specificity and accountability to really fulfill the goals of Sarbanes-Oxley, 20 years old, and the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act just a year and a half old. Make no mistake, if we're able to finalize a statement of protocol, and that's really up to our counterparties in China, but if we're able to finalize it, the proof will still be in the pudding. While important, any framework is merely a step in the process. In light of the time required to conduct inspections, as well as to fulfill COVID-19 quarantine requirements, a statement of protocol really would need to be signed very soon if the inspections have any chance to be completed by the end of this calendar year. And this could be particularly important as Congress is considering, considering accelerating the timeline from the three years of the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act down to two years. Regardless of outcome, whether we're able to uh, uh, find a resolution and the inspectors are able to inspect completely, I look forward to ensuring that the key investor protections in our markets with China-based issuers if the law is followed or without China-based issues if they leave, um, we've got to focus on the investor protections. So happy birthday, Sarbanes-Oxley. In the last 20 years, we've learned a lot. We've made progress. Public company audits have improved, but let's not forget the core lessons. It's important to have robust and independent organizations setting standards, inspecting firms, enforcing the rules. It's important to ensure auditor independence and to guard against inherent conflicts that might arise when auditing and other services are mixed. Thirdly, it's important that corporations and their senior executives are held accountable for their financial statements. Fourth, it's important that all issuers, whether foreign or domestic, are on a level playing field when it comes to the investor protections that Sarbanes-Oxley laid out. There's more work to be done if Sarbanes-Oxley is gonna meet its full potential. Trust in our markets can grow and that benefits investors and issuers alike. After all, as Mr. Wright, and my grandfather said, liars will figure, so it's especially important to have rules of the road and a cop on the beat to figure them out. Rob, back to you. Hey, thank you, Chair, and, um, and thanks for that speech. I think we got a lot to talk about. Uh, I wanted to start, however, with just, you always have a little history in your speeches, and I want to just ask about your history 
with Sarbanes-Oxley. I understand that, I think you were a volunteer, that you wanted to come in as an unpaid volunteer to help out the senator. Um, and then I'm also wondering, when, when you were doing this, were you thinking, oh, I should give the SEC a big budget because in two decades, I'll be running the place? <laughs> No, Rob, I, I didn't think I didn't think that at all. But I had gotten to know uh, the senator. I was honored to serve President Clinton at his treasury, and I got to know the senator while he was the ranking member on the Senate Banking Committee. And then when the crisis broke in December of 2001, I think it might have been in January, I, I caught up uh, his legislative director. I've got the title right, Steve Harris. And I said to Steve, is there any way I could help out? And I remember Steve saying, how much time do you have? And lo and behold, the next day it got me on the call with the Senator who was then the chair of the Senate Banking Committee. And uh, I went in and saw him in a few days. He asked for some thoughts and a memo. And uh, for the next uh, eight or 10 months, we, we worked uh, with this remarkable team that the senator had of Marty Grimberg and Steve Harris and Steve Kroll and others, just a remarkable group of people. Um, I did, by the way, eventually go on paid uh, a staff because um, when we got into negotiations with other offices that they, they thought that was you know, more appropriate that I would uh, uh, be on. But um, he was a remarkable... He's a very thoughtful senator, uh, so respected by his colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Uh, it was great working with him. So now on to some of the topics that you raised in the speech. I guess the other question I want to ask is just broadly, there hasn't been another Enron. There hasn't been another WorldCom. So top line, was the law a success? Did you guys get what you wanted in the thing? And, and are investors getting better information and is audit quality up? I think that it has made progress. I think it has made a difference. I think there's still work to be done to fully live up to the uh, the uh, vision uh, around the standards. I think, uh, as I said in my prepared remarks, that too many of those interim standards are still in place 20 years later. And, and look, our capital markets change and technology changes, but it was always the intent that an independent group the Public Company Accounting Board would, would update and put in place standards and hold people accountable with you know, tight auditing standards that weren't as clubby as the prior regime. I think we still have progress, as I say, on foreign issuers. I mean, 50 or 52 have complied. And importantly, there's this uh, uh, ongoing negotiation with China. And I think we've had, um, an auditor independence, uh, uh, some, as I said, some, some, uh, I don't know how to best put it, but some, some shifts over these 20 years that uh, need to be looked at and make sure that we redouble the effort on that auditor independence. So let's address each one of those, um, because I remember being at the first PCAOB press briefing ever, and they said two things. They said, we're going to hire a lot of people, and we're going to finish the auditing standards as quickly as possible. One of them happened, the other didn't. And I just was wondering, like, what's your assessment on why this has happened? What have you directed the PCAOB to do here? And do you think it's realistic that they could do these all really quickly? So uh, these are always um, a, a bit of challenge for any agency. You do uh, things at the SEC and at the PCOB through various notice and comment procedures and hearing from the public. And it takes a lot of, uh, of focus and dedication. And um, But I'll leave the history to that to others. I, I, I believe under Chair Williams and with Kara Stein and Tony Thompson and Christina Ho and Dwayne is part, uh, the board, that they're dedicated to uh, the, the agenda they put out. And um, I hope, as I said, you know, a year from now when, when Surveyance Oxy is 21, they've made more progress and they continue to make progress uh, on this agenda. Let's talk a little bit about enforcement. You mentioned enforcement. Um, and the SEC often works with the PCOB on enforcement cases, but there's also a perception that the PCOB has been lax on enforcement over the years. 
Uh, part of that, I think, is because Sarbanes-Oxley uh, gave them a different kind of, um, they have to keep their enforcement cases secret for longer than, say, the SEC does. And I was wondering what you think about that and should that be changed? Um, no, I, I think that, again, under the, the leadership there, that they there's going to be robust investigations and where appropriate enforcement and working with uh, our team at the SEC under uh, uh, Director Graywall, uh, there'll be the appropriate uh, uh, following the facts and the law where they take us. Um, I think that, that often agencies like ours at the SEC keep things confidential because if we don't bring a case, uh, I think that we do have a system where we don't want to in any way um, reveal to the public that investigation if we decide that no the facts and law are it's, it's not appropriate to bring something so you're but, okay with it now the pcob that it's kept confidential until there's a re uh, resolution whereas with you guys if you sue somebody you know it's public or if you bring a case at the sec but are you okay Con with congress that? did take a little bit different uh, approach i even remember some of those debates at the time um and and uh, and, and part of those debates were just that recognizing that the SEC was and still is here. And of course, if there was any criminal side, the Department of Justice was there, uh, that the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board had a little bit different role than uh, the, the official sector uh, being uh, the SEC and the Department of Justice. So the last uh, PCOB question, but um you recently turned over the majority of the board uh chair clayton before you did the same thing and i'm wondering if you think this sets a precedent that uh will maybe make the pcob a little more political if every administration comes in and puts in their own people and is that a good thing and you know at the sec the staggered terms works pretty well to keep kind of a political balance there well there are also staggered terms at the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, but this was taken up by the U.S. Supreme Court about, uh, I want to say, 10 or 11 years ago. So, and I even remember talking to Senator Sarbanes about this when the Supreme Court changed something in in that original law. They found it constitutional that Sarbanes Oxley was constitutional, but they said that the board uh, needed to be, uh, in essence, at will to the SEC. Commission. The five members of the commission could, um, as you say, uh, recruit, but also replace the board. And that was the Supreme Court's view. And so we follow on that. And you're you're right. That's that is the case that that accountability uh, could could lead to turnover. I think we we recruited a, a terrific uh, uh, ads. I mean, uh, member disbarred state on the board, but we, we recruited some additional ads and I think um, uh, they each have staggered terms, as I say, and I don't want to uh, presume what will happen, you know, uh, later times, but uh, in fact, set, uh, member Thompson, I think uh, uh, we just appointed for another five year term because his term is up this October. Got it. Now, moving on to independence, which I thought maybe you gave us a little news here on that, uh, and you said that you thought maybe the SEC should take a fresh look at independence rules. Um, can you flesh that out? Does that mean that there's a rule coming? So I, I, I've asked staff and I certainly asked uh, the PCOB, uh, there's a auditor independence standards at the PCOB, and then there's a role at the Securities and Exchange Commission and they work uh, together. Uh, so I've, I've asked it both to consider what would be appropriate here and particularly if the PCOB, in addition to what they laid out earlier this spring, uh, uh, think that it would be appropriate to address and update the auditor independent standards. I remember in surveys, actually, the, the, there was a draft at one point that solved the auditor independence issue or sought to solve it by having mandatory firm rotation. That's something that's been going on in the EU. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about that here. That has been kind of, it was rejected in the law. And of course the PCOB considered it a while back and did nothing. 
Um, I, I um, Rob, I appreciate the question. I remember the debates again from a couple decades ago, but as you say, it was not adopted in the law. Um, and, but I do think I do think that the key is really to ensure that we mitigate conflicts to the best we can. Uh, and and as there were certain steps that were taken 18 and 20 years ago, right as the law passed. And to, to sort of always looking at how to ensure that the auditing function is not in some way uh, compromised by other parts of these complex relationships uh, within the auditing firms that are possibly consulting or consulting with affiliates of, of the audit uh, client. Now, as, as you talked a little bit in your speech about this, and and there have been, you know, reports that one of the big four is considering spinning off at least some of its consulting business. Um, and I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the the kind of the multidisciplinary model in auditing. And also, um, you know, is that a good thing? And what about is there a room for an audit only model? What do you think about all this? Well, I I, I think that all the firms, it's appropriate that they be vigilant. Uh, uh, just to ensure, as I said in my prepared remarks, that that whatever whatever non-audit business they have does not somehow compromise that audit business. And um, uh, even even 20 years ago, there was an appreciation that there were certain non-audit services like tax preparation and the like uh, that would be done, but that it doesn't somehow uh, that those potential conflicts not uh, inhibit it. And what we've seen over the 20 years, it's a little bit more complicated. There's, there's, there's a, a, a regrowth of a lot of the consulting business, uh, but that it, that it not somehow uh, influence or compromise you know, the, the auditing and making sure that the, you know, as I sort of said about uh, Mr. Wright or my, my grandpa Ellis, you know, that the, that the Figures don't lie, but uh, guard against the liars uh, trying to figure. Uh, you also mentioned FASB. Um, the Sox gave it independent funding, partly to shield it from political pressure. Um, but FASB, there's a there's a people really think it's been inactive in some of these areas that are important right now: ESG slash climate or crypto. Uh, we're not seeing anything out of out of FASB on that. Um, and I'm wondering if you think they should should um, get moving on any of these issues. But I think, and, and this is, uh, Rob, I would say this would be the case, whether it's for the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, or FASB, that our markets are changing at a quicker pace than when I started in finance, if I, I don't mind saying, four decades ago. It just, it just, it's, the technology is changing more rapidly. We've got international competitors to our capital markets that are, aren't going to just leave us at the top and so forth. And so it's important, whether it's an agenda at the Securities and Exchange Commission or to your question, the Financial Accounting uh, uh, Board, that they, they, they act on issues, taking into consideration public comment, but act on it in a thoughtful but expeditious manner with some sense of urgency when new matters arise, whether, as you said, it's around um, uh, new technologies uh, um, or, or, or how new business models come along. Um, speaking of kind of public comment and, and accounting standards, there's been a lot of pushback about your step accounting bulletin 121 on um, on crypto accounting, and some people say that it's basically the SEC creating gap, and that there should be um, there should be more public input in that. And I wonder if you could speak to kind of some of those criticisms. So let me let me just say, I mean, it goes back to the 1930s, but but Congress did give the Securities and Exchange Commission way back in in the early 1930s oversight of accounting for public companies, and over the decades our first three or four decades in, in service, we put out various accounting bulletins. Uh, they were called something different than staff accounting bulletins at the time. 
And then when FASB was created about 50 years ago, we started to number what we did differently. So you said this was Staff Accounting Bulletin 121. That's because there's been 120 before this over 50 years. So you could do the math. That's two to three a year. I think there's been two of them since I've been chair. Paul Munter, our chief accountant, uh, leads that. And this was consistent with what we've done on the other 120 of them. This is the same process that we've done in the before. And, and um, uh, it gives uh, issuers, public company issuers, advice. And in this case, we had a number of, of companies coming to us saying, how, how do you think this should be accounted for? And um, it's, it's very different than other parts of the market. Uh, custody, what, is, what does custody mean? What custody in crypto often means that the public no longer has ownership of their Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. And in fact, if the, the wallet provider or the crypto exchange or crypto lending platform goes bankrupt, and we've had a number go bankrupt in the last two months, Rob, True. when they go bankrupt, guess what? The customers are just in line at bankruptcy court. So, uh, we've had a lot of problems over the years with companies trying to push uh, things off balance sheet. I uh, just uh, uh, referenced the 2008 financial crisis, if you wish. And so Paul and his team uh, took this up and thoughtfully put out a staff accounting bulletin that uh, the, the custody arrangements aren't well enough developed and that crypto is sufficiently different than custody for uh, you know, stocks and bonds, um, that this should be on balance sheet. So we may have uh, time for one more question, I think. Um, you're in the middle of a big climate disclosure rule and auditing or assurance plays a big role in that. I'm wondering if you can just talk about, um, do you think it is important to have these disclosures audited? Should they be in the financial statements? Um, and do you anticipate any changes coming as, as you know, you get in comments on this? Oh, we've gotten, I think well over 14,000 comments on the climate risk disclosure and the staff still going through. So uh, we appreciate the public comment. We always uh, look to do things within the law and, and based on the economics, um, but I can't get ahead of the staff's got a lot of work here to do yet. Rob. All right. Well, well, thanks. I tried. And, and thanks for all your time, Chair, and, and your speech. And it's, uh, it's nice to talk to you. And we appreciate having you at the event. Terrific. And thank you again for the center for inviting me to speak and happy birthday, Sarbanes-Oxley. We're a nation of dreamers, hard at work to make a better life for our families. And auditors are right there with us, working hard to help us build our future and realize the world's possibilities. Auditors bring trust and transparency to the capital markets that power our economy and everyday life by enabling investors and the public to make informed decisions. Auditors are independent gatekeepers protecting capital markets, and now they're bringing accountability to corporate information on issues like climate change, sustainability, and diversity and inclusion. The audit profession's bold ambition strives to drive opportunity and make our economy more resilient with lasting progress through valuing diverse backgrounds, ideas, and experiences. That's the public-driven nature of the audit profession. Independent gatekeepers of capital markets, protecting investors and the public, helping promote inclusion and opportunity. That's auditors in action. Let's move over to the, the virtual fireplace, I guess. And uh, we have a chat here with Joe Yu, the CEO of Deloitte US, and Julie Bell Lindsay, the CEO of the Center for Audit Quality. And um, nice to see you guys. And lot to talk about in the in the chair speech. Um, I want to start um, just also with a little bit of history. Joe, you're an auditor. You were at front lines uh, 20 years ago when Sarbanes-Oxley happened. I wonder if you could just talk a bit about what it was like as, as the mounting accounting scandals uh, happened and what you were feeling and doing, and then what happened when Sarbanes-Oxley started to come in line, and how did things change, um, and what was it like then working as an auditor? Rob, good to be here. 
uh, it really is a trip down memory lane. I do want to begin on behalf of the profession with a, a sincere thanks to Chairman Gensler for joining us at what is a, a really important occasion for all of us. As I look back, the events that transpired 20 years ago were pretty foundational to my career. I was pretty early on. It was a scary time to see the public lose confidence in my chosen profession. And then the veracity of the policy response, this was front page news every day. Congress passed this legislation unanimously in the Senate. Can you imagine today a major piece of legislation on anything passing unanimously? It just, it spoke to the fact that this wasn't a partisan issue, not a political issue. It was an overwhelming consensus that things were broken and fundamental change was necessary. And, and I think what you've seen is the profession worked very hard to rise to the occasion and embrace that call for change and, and doing so all under the umbrella of a very stringent regulatory regime that was imposed. People like to talk about you know, auditing the auditors and you can see on the ground, both the behavioral impact that's had on those who know that their work will be held to the very highest standards. And then in terms the, of the, the work that the firms have done to embrace improvements to quality, massive investments, bringing online new technology platforms, training, uh, instituting systems of quality controls to make sure that we're identifying issues ourselves. And, and maybe more important than any of that, just the fundamental tone and culture that you've seen the profession institute throughout these firms in terms of trying to draw a connection for all of our people between the work they do day to day and the reliance of the public on the profession. And probably the most important part of my job is to make certain that that's imparted in every new generation that joins us. I couldn't help but reflect on the fact that with this 20 year anniversary, it is not long from now that we will have people joining our firms who were not even born when Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted. And so carrying forward that legacy of public interest and making certain that's inculcated into the culture of everyone who's entrusted with that solemn obligation to be a public company auditor, very, very important that we have events like this to remember what went wrong and to recommit to making certain that we honor that public trust going forward. That's an amazing thought about uh, your new employees coming in. And I guess the only positive thing is it means that we're closer to retirement, hopefully. So, um, Julie, I, I wanted to ask you a similar question, but you were at the SEC. You were a staffer there as all this was going on. And um, what was the mood like? What was it like to, you know, at the time, everybody said this is a transformational law. So what was it like doing that? And then kind of as how, how you look at the post Sox era, how do you assess things and assess audit quality? Sure, thank you. Um, thanks very, very much, Rob. And yes, Joe, thanks for making me so old as, as well. Um, so yeah, I was at the SEC um, in the Division of Corporation Finance, and it just so happened I was actually in the Office of Rulemaking at the time of the implementation from like end of 2002 to um, middle of 2004. And the, the mood, it really depended on the day, quite frankly. Um, but the mood was really energized, um, really feeling like the staff felt like we have the opportunity here to execute and implement this really new and different and novel kind of law that came out of, of Congress. Um, I, I do remember one little anecdote, just waiting. Let, let's just put it this way. The, the equipment of the SEC at the time, I think was still from 1933 or so, because we all fought over the printers because there were so many you know, rule proposals and other things that we were printing. Um, I remember just waiting around, it's not the water cooler, we're hanging around the printers. Um, but it was, it was very energized and really feeling like, you know, kind of a, you know, the need to do our part as, as public servants to, to execute and really restore the trust in the capital markets that has been quite frankly decimated um, during all of that. I, I will say that, I, I'm a securities lawyer, as you know, and I came from representing public companies and going into the SEC at that time really impressed upon me the need to take all different viewpoints into consideration, whether it's a regulatory viewpoint, certainly the investor viewpoint, 
um, other viewpoints. And that's something that I've carried with me when I left the SEC throughout my career, um, including in this current position. Um, as, as far as audit quality, you know, I think the chair mentioned this as well. Um, the CAQ, we actually had uh, a 10 year anniversary of, of Sarbanes-Oxley and we had Senator Sarbanes and Representative Oxley come in and speak. And they were asked the question, you know, how do you feel about the law? Has it succeeded? And they both talked about the fact that, you know, no framework is going to eliminate all bad actors. There's always gonna be bad actors out there, but from their perspective, you know, had, had another Enron or WorldCom happens, as you noted to the chair, and the answer 10 years ago was no, and the answer 10 years later, you know, is, is still no. But that does not mean that we need to, you know, take our, our foot off the pedal and really be vigilant. Um, so I think if you look at just the fact that there's been no other N1 or WorldCom, you know, you can look at other indices like restatement levels, PCAB deficiency levels with the firms, you know, are all trending down. But again, I want to st stress that there always needs to be a focus on audit quality. Good. Well, um, he gave us a lot to talk about in the speech. Like I said, I want to just get your quick reaction. This one's for Julie, but, you know, he brought up some um, I, kind of what he thinks is good backsliding by the auditing profession uh, on independence and also in the enforcement area and ethics. And I just wondered if you had a response to that. Well, I'll take the second one first um, on the, the ethics um, that was discussed in the chair speech. I mean, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, Rob. Um, integrity and ethics is at the heart of being an independent auditor. As the chair said, we are gatekeepers. It's the heart of that. It's literally part of the license we have to do the work that we do. Um, you know, based on what I understand, you know, certain members of our profession violated those standards and that harmed not only them, but certainly taints the profession at large. Um, the, the system does have in place processes, safeguards to root out, mitigate, raise, you know, the inevitable bad actors that are out there, raise, raise those issues to the, to the front. And that happened in this case. And we are pleased to see that corrective action has been taken and will continue to be taken. Um, as far as independent, again, it's at the heart of what we do. It, our work is to be objective skeptical, be a second set of eyes on management financial reporting. If we're, if we're not being the gatekeeper, if we're just opening up the gate and letting everybody through, we're not doing our job. So it's at the core of what we do. And I certainly would love to have Joe weigh in on how, you know, how they look at Deloitte on monitoring independence. But I think the one thing I, I want to stress is there are a lot of checks and balances in the system already established by Sarbanes-Oxley with independent over, or oversight of the independent auditor by the audit committee. You have the PCOB inspection process. Um, you have other checks and balances that are in place. And you also have to realize that there's a lot of market-driven incentives that are in place on the audit firms. Um, litigation, if there's an issue, if there's an independence issue. Regulatory enforcement, you heard the chair say, and I do want to stress, the SEC and the PCB share in enforcement authority over auditors and um, audit matters. But at the end of the day, you also have reputational risk because, you know, Rob, people like you love to report and, and write headlines when there's a particular issue. And I think you need to off, often keep in mind all of those issues as well. Yeah. And, and Joe, I'd love to hear from you on this because you run a massive firm and you seem very committed to the uh, multidisciplinary model and the consulting and the auditing. So, how do you deal with this? Well, we should just take a giant step back and, and, and put the real issue on the table, which is that we get paid by our clients. And so inherently the question will become, can, can you be a gatekeeper? Can you do this work objectively if you were receiving compensation from the company for which you're performing this, this service? That is what Sarbanes-Oxley was all about. It was about sort of raising the elephant in the room, recognizing the potential, and putting in place countermeasures and sufficient protections to incent the right behavior and to ensure severe consequences if that's not lived up to. Because ultimately, this is the foundation of why the investing public values the public company audit, that someone independent and objective is coming in and doing this work in issuing an opinion. 
Sarbanes-Oxley said, you no, you no longer as auditors report to the management team that you're auditing, you're reporting to that company's own independent board. It's very clear that the audit committee of the company is directly responsible for the appointment, compensation, and oversight of the independent auditor. That's a, a very stringent safeguard. You had strict scope of services prohibitions. I think Sarbanes-Oxley got this right, that it banned firms from performing a whole host of consultative services that could compromise the objectivity and impartiality of the auditor. There are circumstances that come up from time to time where a firm doesn't meet that standard, where a firm violates it. There should be consequences, and those consequences should be severe, but let's not confuse that with the rule being problematic. And, and then you have an independent regulator, the PCAOB, and as someone who has personally been inspected by the PCAOB, I can tell you the veracity of that process and the conduct they expect to see when they come in and inspect our work. And so as professionals, lots of professionals in different industries have potential conflicts. You wanna make certain you have the systems and incentives in place to combat those conflicts. And that's really the enduring legacy of Sarbanes-Oxley. So uh, as the chair said that, you know, he's, he thinks maybe the PCAOB should do new independent standards and the SEC maybe should do independent independence rules. This is to either of you, but uh, do you think they're necessary? And then um, what do you think th they would entail or address? Well, well, one thing that I think we as a profession um, learned and embraced very clearly is that we don't write our own rules and, and we leave it to regulators to decide what needs to be looked at and what's in the public interest. And all of us in the profession want to continue evolving and getting better at what we do and making certain the public has absolute confidence. I do think, though, that when you know the questions aren't different. The underlying issues were debated at length with the full public spotlight in terms of what's in the public interest to ban and restrict, and Congress put that in place, and there's rules the PCOB has issued to implement the specifics, and if those things can continue to be enhanced, great, but by and large, I think we've seen those, those rules when they're followed are quite effective. When they're not followed, um, something breaks down and there should be consequences and there should be enforcement and there should be measures in place to ensure those who don't honor the public trust and follow those rule sets uh, are, are frankly not sort of given that license to serve the public in the way that we are. So uh, we've got a few more minutes here. I wanted to ask you something the Chair Gensler didn't talk about is kind of the future. Um, and what does corporate reporting look like in the future? What are the issues that you guys see on the horizon? Uh, so maybe start with, with Julie on that. Yeah, it's a great question, Rob. Uh, you know, if you think about when the securities laws were written way back when, I, I think I read something the other day that, you know, the vast majority, if not all, of the S&P 500 consisted of companies that made tangible products with tangible assets. Um, you know, you shift gears and move to 2020, 2022 that we're in, and that's not the case anymore. You know, the I think 90% of the S&P 500, um, the value of those companies is made up of intangible assets. And the industries that are most prominent are information technology, finance, healthcare. So you have a whole shift in how companies operate and how they create value. You also have a whole, you know, certainly the audited financial statements of the 10Ks are you know, the bedrock of financial reporting. But you also have different ways in which information is being provided by public companies. And the market's moving on information like earnings releases. It's moving on things like analyst presentations, investor days that public companies have. Um, you know, so the whole, there's a whole shift in paradigm of how information is being exchanged. And I think you see a lot of this kind of new way of getting information and company reported information that investors are asking for on the SEC's rulemaking agenda, whether it's climate, whether it's cybersecurity, um, other types of issues. And so you, you also, you mentioned to the chair, the, the SEC's climate proposal does have an assurance component to it. Just like Congress recognized in Sarbanes-Oxley with internal controls over financial reporting, assurance provided on other areas outside of historical financial statements really goes a long way towards investor protection. It's been recognized again and again. And I think that was another recognition by information on climate where investors are asking for it 
having assurance on that information. The, the auditor skill set that is brought to the table on financial information, whether it's independence or objectivity, skepticism, standards-based analysis, all of those skill sets, it, auditors aren't a one-trick pony. Those skill sets can be applied to other areas of information. And we're seeing that happen um, as we speak. So before we go, and we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you guys about kind of an important um, area, I think, to both of you and to the profession, which is about you know recruiting talent and specifically recruiting more diverse talent to the profession. I know Deloitte has a, its program made. The CAQ has Accounting Plus. So, but either one of you, what's the what's important about this, and what's the profession's approach to DEI right now? Well, th this is critical to the future of the profession. Talent is the number one issue in making sure this is an attractive profession to a broad cross section of the population. I have been encouraged by the way that the professions come together through the CAQ to embrace this. We should own up to the fact that we have a real issue here. The representation historically within the profession is nowhere near the broader population at large. And as a result, we're trying to get at the longstanding root causes and get them fixed with big investments. You mentioned the sort of Deloitte investment in what we call MADE, the Making Accounting Diverse and Equitable, a $75 million investment. Uh, other firms have sort of similarly stepped up and we're publicly reporting on the progress. We actually just yesterday issued our annual Deloitte DEI transparency report. And you can see meaningful movement meaningful increases in the representation of black professionals in the representation of Latinx professionals. And this is something that all of the firms are aligned around and backed by real action and dollars to ensure that we are attracting in the next generation of diverse talent into the profession. Good, Julie, anything quickly before we, uh... Are we rolling? No, I'm running out of time. Um, I would just encourage, we did launch Bold Ambition and um, Accounting Plus earlier this year. Check out the website. I want to stress this is really, you know, being led by the CAQ, a collective, collaborative approach across the accounting and auditing profession to, to deal with the, the issue. And um, we've got a lot of momentum. I'm very excited about it. Great. Well, thank you both. I really appreciate your time. And this was a uh, fun and uh, hopefully at, at uh, Sarbanes Oxy 25, we could all meet in person. It's a date. All right. That's thanks. great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob.